Is there any resemblance? Do you see any resemblance to me, to this picture? Or to this young man, Vincent, to this picture? Or to Ellen White? There's no resemblance at all. I keep telling these young people that these big sports teams have lost something. I've been spit upon. I've been called a pathetic loser simply because I presented change to people. And the only words I chose to use was when my culture, when my spirituality, when my tradition that I attempt to practice is taken into sport entertainment, it offends me. It's about our future. And those of you who don't understand this issue, we're here to try to help you understand it. It's very simple. To reduce the victims of genocide to a stereotype symbol or mascot is immoral, and it is unkind, and it is no honor. And it's actually simpler than that. Stereotypes dehumanize, period. But what did it really mean for a newspaper editor whose publication makes people sad, mad, and glad every day? It seemed to me that it clearly meant that I ought to deeply consider that if these nicknames were offending a certain and important part of my audience, then I needed to get rid of those names. It seemed like a basic, humane gesture to my fellow man. And I wonder, where do these supposed educators, uh, where are they coming from when Native Americans say, we don't like it, we think it denigrates our religion and our culture, <laughs> please stop. Why shouldn't they stop? We're asking, where is the honor? Charlene Teeters uh, comes to us from the uh, Spokane Nation. She is the vice president of the uh, National Coalition on Racism in Sports and Media, uh, the reason we are here today. She's also a professor at the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She was the subject of the award-winning documentary, In Whose Honor, or, or pronounced better, In Whose Honor. Uh, please welcome uh, to the podium our next keynote speaker, Charlene Teeters. What an honor to be in the same room with the many of my mentors and heroes. Uh, this is really an honor for me, and um, I just want to um, um, put my watch up here first to make sure I don't go on too long, because I know we're on a... <laughs> tight schedule here. I am a Spokane indigenous to what is now Washington State. Uh, we are people um, that are classified um, uh, by what um, is adopted by the United States of America, Indians. Um, but what you call us, um, you know, is, you know, another discussion. Um, all of us would prefer to be called by our nation names. I am a Spokane. Uh, we are not stereotypes. We are not those things that they put forward, those objects. We are the human beings. Because when you translate the names that we have for ourselves, they translate to mean the human beings, the real people, the original people, the first people, or simply just to our humanness in some way. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, my grandmother was born February 2nd, 1900, and was given the name uh, Nancy Moses. And Many of our people uh, at that time, their own names were being stripped from them, and they were given names that were imposed upon the people. Um, and that was part of the process of trying to strip away everything that was central to our identity as Native people. We call them hat names from our part of the country. My grandmother, my Tupia, when she was holding my grandmother in her arms, that was the process that was going on as they were imprisoned on what was left of our homeland. Um, my Tupia Shishimta, her hat name was Ellen Moses, and my um, Sila Stuasi, his hat name was Joseph Moses. And in that hat, they had the names of presidents and or religious 
names. That's why we've got some of these names. I, I think we heard earlier uh, someone talking about their given name or the imposed name, John Smith. That's where some of these names come from. The end of the 19th century saw continued great change to the environment and to the original people of the Northwest and of you know, what we now call the United States. Treaties were written and broken. Within one generation, entire villages disappeared. My people were confined to the reservation, not only by the United States Army, but by vigilante groups, basically the hate groups of the time, um, who hunted down native people if they left the reservation. And starvation was the reality of the original people at that time, um, less than you know 100 years ago. Boarding schools that followed in the early 20th century were designed to destroy the family unit. My grandmother, my Tupia, my Shishipta, and my Tzila witnessed their children gathered up, sometimes by force, taken away to um, missionary or government-run schools where they greatly suffered and many of them died. Of my grandmother's my grandmother had 12 children in a tar paper shack on the Spokane Reservation, and only four lived to be adults. And that was not unusual during that time period. The one boy that survived, my Uncle Frank, served this country in uniform, as so many Native people did, in spite of this history. The trauma of this time period broke traditional support systems apart. The religion of my grandparents, my Tupia and my Tzila, was made illegal, and many of the things that were central to their identity, the regalia, um, the bundles, the feathers were gathered up and burned, or sometimes they were sold to outside collectors. That's how come the, um, the Nez Perce material ended up in the Ohio State Historical Collection. So that's what happened to many of those things. This is my grandmother's generation that I talk about. And I share the slice of history because many of the pro-chief, pro-image uh, uh, people um, who use these images, like the University of Illinois and uh, University of North Dakota, they use um, our own people um, against us to support these stereotypes. And I share this history because it shouldn't surprise many of us when we have this kind of history of uh, abuse and subordination and genocide um, that we have some of our own people who participate in their own oppression. And we should understand what that is when they go out of their way to look for that one native person who supports them. Um, it shouldn't surprise us and one we should recognize it for what it is and it's race baiting uh, when a university goes out of its way. Uh, to look for people who um, support the use of these Indian mascots. Because uh, confusion and ignorance is our biggest enemy out there. It's the biggest enemy of oppressed people everywhere. Um, it's taken generations for Native people to come back from this trauma that I talked about. My mother had an eighth grade education and she had six children. And at age 75, she still gets up every day and goes to work to perform what many would consider menial labor. She is a, a maid. Her hands are among the brown hands, the many brown hands that invisibly clean the floors and empty the trash across America. And at age 75, her labor to me has always been honorable. Of her six children, I'm the only one who has a college degree. Coming from this background, uh, going, coming from my homeland and from this history, going to the University of Illinois, a Big Ten university, was a dream come true. I was the first generation to go. And the two, the two other folks that were um, recruited along with me, uh, Norman Akers and Marcus Ammerman and myself, all first generation Native people to go to get an advanced degree. It was a dream come true that very quickly turned into a nightmare because the university used as its athletic identity an Indian mascot. And who would think to ask that question as you're looking for a university? Who would think that that's an important question to ask? 
because universities should be an environment where all people's background and religion is respected. And what we found was anything but honor and respect. When we got to that campus, we walked around, and of course, like any people, we look for our community. We look for people who are like us. And we're walking around this Big Ten University with its Greek pillars and its Ivy League buildings. And we asked the questions, where are the other Native students on this campus? Is there a Native Studies program? Is there a Native faculty member? Is there a Native center that helps counsel and, and retain Native students? The answer to those questions was no. We soon realized that we were the Native community on this campus of 36,000 students who used as their athletic identity an Indian mascot. And of course, the other thing that happens on a campus, on any campus, is that the first few weeks that you're there, they're introducing you to all of the school traditions. So you learn the fight song, you might learn the colors, you might learn all of the traditions that go with becoming part of a university um, community. And of course, because they had this Indian identity as their you know, athletic identity, um, all of their activities, their songs, um, had some kind of variation of Indian themes. And because there was no Native community to challenge the stereotypes that were so prevalent within the community, it was, it was very hard. We saw some very um, awful things uh, that we've seen, of course, across the country. I'm going to show you some examples. But on this campus, some of the sororities and fraternities would have Indian caricatures on their posters to advertise whatever event was happening. There was buck and squaw dances. There was a sorority that had the Miss Illini Squaw Contest. And of course, it, um, squaw is the most derogatory term you could refer to a native woman. Its race neutral term is whore. And it's actually much more crass and offensive than that. But it's very specifically directed at native people when you use the word squaw. There was a bar that had a fallen down neon sign of an Indian person falling down over and over again. It was called Home of the Drinking Illini that had this caricature of this dumb Indian, big belly, big nose, buck teeth, crooked feather, crosses in his eyes, falling down over and over again. And so being in this environment became incredibly harmful and hurtful to us, especially when you're three students on a campus of 36,000 students, what do you possibly do? We did not feel welcome, and we did not feel safe in this environment. Our universities and schools owe all their students a safe environment without the distraction, without the additional burden of bigotry. And our leaders of consciousness, our university presidents, owe and must set the tone for that environment of respect, or the message is clear. It need not exist for all people, because their inaction is saying that it's OK to target a group of people. And when any of our people are targeted, all of us, from whatever background we come from, should feel that we, too, are at risk of being targeted. That safe environment will never exist at the University of Illinois. It will never exist at the University of North Dakota. It will never exist at Florida State Seminoles as long as they have a race-based image as their mascot. There should be no doubt that race, ethnicity, religion, cultural markings, and national origin are at the very core of our objections to the use of these symbols. Because when they use these symbols, I'm going to show you some examples that are very hurtful. This comes from the University of North Dakota. And this.
that when they look at those symbols, you're not looking at it and you're confusing it with some other group of people. You don't think that maybe it's East Indian or Asian or some other race of people. You're not looking at those symbols and confusing with any other group of people. Does anyone not recognize these images as not, as not meant to represent Indian people? Because they do. This is what they're supposed to. You know, you're not, you're not confused that they maybe are referring to another group of people. In fact, many of the proponents of these symbols will agree and feel perfectly comfortable telling everyone that this is what we think of as Indian. They will even tell us with these caricatures that it's honorable to our face. And I tell them, don't insult my intelligence by telling me these honor our people. My family is honorable. The people in this room are honorable. These are not. It has nothing to do with who we are as Indian people, as indigenous people. And it has everything to do with playing Indian. It has everything to do with stereotypes. And we shouldn't confuse this. Stereotypes dehumanize, period, for those people who do not understand this. So powerful is these publicly supported stereotypes that Native people in the community are not allowed to define themselves. They are predefined by these images put forward by these educational uh, systems. What we have in these universities is a litmus test because it becomes um, a litmus test for how you will be treated. They find out you're a native person in the community and they'll ask you, what do you think of this symbol? What do you think? And then you're treated according to how you respond. Are you a good Indian? Or are you a bad Indian? And anything that divides our communities should be one of those things that is a concern for those peoples of consciousness, our leaders within our educational systems, our leaders within our communities. We ask of you today to get these things out of our way, not just out of the way of Native people, but non-Native people. Remove these racist shackles and lodestones that we did not ask for. <laughs> Remove them. Get them out of our way. We did not devise these things. Get them out of our way and we will show you who we are. <laughs> You see, we've been here before. We've been here time and time again. Every opportunity we get to speak to a group, we're here because it's very hard for us to be hurt in this country. I'm sorry. Because we are tokens in our own homeland. And it's very hard for us to be hurt. But we have many people on the front lines out there. We have been here, and we'll continue to come back over and over again, speaking into the same empty, non-responsive hole in the hearts of these people who refuse to hear us. We are saying the same thing. We said it to Columbus. We said it to Andrew Jackson. We said it to Teddy Roosevelt. We said it to Custard. And now we say it to you. And you see, it's very simple. We are human. We are human. I'm going to end with that. Thank you. Charlene, thank you very much. We have a a lot of people to speak today, but if we only had heard you, um, that should suffice. <laughs>